Our next bit of news here, which is another, <laughs> I guess I, I do have a rant about this particular topic, but not without reason. Our next major topic here is the Assassin's Creed Shadows drama. And man, oh man, is this, is this a never-ending tale of nonstop drama surrounding this game. So news came out this week that the game had been delayed until February of 2025. This news hits after the somewhat bizarre timing of a controversy that stemmed forth from a figurine that they revealed. And that figurine, oh boy, did that, uh, that makes people upset. Give me a second here while I pull that up. (laughs) Let me show you guys the figurine I'm talking about. Give me a second here. You might have saw a brief clip, a brief snippet of that when I, uh, accidentally hit that image on stream but i'll show it now here we go so here's the uh the figurine that they show as promotional material for the game that you can pick up now for the uninformed you might look at this and think what's wrong with this i don't see anything wrong with this it's the it's the character yasuke and Naoi. they're they're both on there looking like funko pop ass figures which i wonder that this is this, this isn't a funko pop thing i don't think it is but they sure look like it however i want you to take note of one very important aspect here the broken tory gate now why is this important <clears throat> there is a shrine in Japan, known as the Sano Shrine, that is famous for its broken Tori Gate. They call it the One-Legged Tori Gate. The reason why this shrine is broken is because this shrine is located in Nagasaki, Japan. For any history buffs out there, you know that Nagasaki was one of the the targets of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Japan during World War II. The blast, the force of said blast of atomic bomb, damaged the Tori Gate at the Sano Shrine. As you can see here, this is what's left of that shrine because of that, because of the events of World War II. So you can see how this would stem controversy as this particular instance of this broken Tory gate has a historical and cultural significance. So much so in Japan, they decided not to repair the Tory gate, but to leave it as it is. And as you can imagine, the Japanese are not very happy about that. As you can see here on this Twitter account I pulled up from a Japanese user, what they say, and I trans- well, this is roughly translated from their post, says, please spread the word Assassin's Creed Shadow figures from Ubisoft, a famous Japanese hate and criminal company. A figurine of a destroyed Tory gate has been released, which is believed to be based on the one leg Tory gate that was destroyed in the Nagasaki atomic bombing. That's from Japanese people. And what's weird about this, to make this even more damning, is... Well, whatever. I'll get. <laughs> I'll get into that a bit later. I, I can't. I can't. I got. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta move forward. We'll get into that a bit later. <laughs> but recently, there was a video that came out by a YouTuber by the name of Legendary Drops. In that video, he talks about how he had a conversation with a lot of Ubisoft employees, talking about the direction of the company and why it is they seem to be missing the mark constantly when it comes to their products, the gaming community as a whole. And, well, in this case of Assassin's Creed Shadows, being offensive to an entire culture of people. (laughs) In that video, one of the devs called out management by saying that the management has been writing a lot of this criticism off as, quote unquote, a toxic and loud minority of gamers and that the outrage behind a lot of what's been happening is all made up. But let's not just hear that from me. Let's watch the video and see that for ourselves, shall we? Make sure I got the volume turned up for this. Oh, 
Hopefully you guys can hear this. They responded saying, at a high level, they rarely talk about it. At a because project level, can't. they brush it off as <laughs> Because apparently I can't talk. hear Hold on. As Asmund Gold correctly pointed out in a video of his, Ubisoft is filled with toxic positivity that prevents any growth. I then asked, what about the Japanese community's backlash over Assassin's Creed Shadows? It's obvious that they haven't done their research, and even the smallest details are going to be noticed by a culture that's as proud as the Japanese. They responded by saying that the criticisms haven't been talked about, and they've only issued demands that we mustn't engage with discussion on that topic publicly. They responded saying, at a high level... So wait, you hear that, right? They've had no talks about this, apparently, according to them. And that they've been encouraged not to engage with it at all, period. And this seems to be a very common sentiment coming from the general gaming space. Not just Ubisoft. This idea, as you see here on the screen, that the company is filled with toxic positivity, which is a very similar case to what happened with a game like Concord, where the studio itself was also filled with this toxic positivity. Macy says, this is why they've been avoiding the Japan setting. If I recall, and this is me trying to really dig back into the far recesses of my mind when it comes to things that I've heard about them avoiding the Japanese setting. I recall, and maybe this is my mind, perhaps, the, the Mandela effect, right? Make, make my mind making this shit up and it never actually happened. But I recall hearing or seeing an article asking about why they hadn't done the Japanese setting. Way back then. And I remember hearing or seeing something about them saying that the Japan that making a game take place in Japan would be too easy and too on the nose. And that they wanted to explore the possibility of making of making Assassin's Creed games that take place in other settings first before jumping on the Japan setting. Again, I could be completely making that up. That that probably that article probably doesn't exist. It's probably my mind just making that shit up. But that's what I recall hearing at one point in time. This was many, many years ago. Before all this shit started happening. But it would make sense, or at least it does explain, why we've gotten so many other games and settings, even settings that don't even make sense for an Assassin's Creed game, before we ever got the obvious setting that makes the most sense for an Assassin's Creed game. So that's that's what I believe is what the case is. Again, this is this is just me pulling this stuff up from the recesses of my mind, and it's been so long that I could be completely misremembering that. I could have completely have made that up in my head. I don't know. So take what I'm saying in regards to that as a, with many grains of salt. I just I don't know why, but I recall hearing something like that. <laughs> Sounds like an excuse to me. Hey, I'm not saying it's not, but that's what I recall hearing. So the end result of what happened here is that right after the controversy went down, the the timing, again, the timing of this is really strange, but also really convenient for the fact that this controversy came out about the Tory gate shit. And that following that immediately was them canceling their Tokyo game show live stream and also canceling the access media press events that they had to give, you know, access media early copies of the game to do previews of the game. They canceled all of that shit immediately. And then follow that up with announcing the delay for the game being all the way until February of 2025. Some people have speculated that they're doing this intentionally to have the game release in time for Black History Month, which is what February is. Which would almost be an even bigger insult considering you added a black... (laughs) Considering one of the biggest controversies about the game is the fact that you decided it was okay to throw in a black samurai and claim that he was an actual person that exists, an actual samurai that existed in Japan at that time, when there is nothing, absolutely nothing, proving that he was. When most people, when it comes to Assassin's Creed, waited over a decade for them to finally make a game that takes place in Japan, because they wanted to enjoy the cultural side of things, the aesthetic, because they, I mean... Obviously, people wanted to play as Asian characters in an Asian game. Surprise. But instead of simply doing that, you decided you were going to turn that idea on its head by by adding a black character as a samurai. <clears throat> and what makes this worse, too, it, <laughs> especially during a time period where there is some rumblings, if you listen closely, 
about, uh, well, unfortunately, racism between black people and Asians. And the first thing that, that you decide to do is make a game with a black man running around killing a bunch of Asians. Just top shelf stuff. Top shelf stuff from Ubisoft. And what I find ironic about all this, whatever. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get into my longer rant about this. I do have a lot to say about this shit. So hold on. 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 <clears throat> Again, I had to write this shit down because this was a lot of this was on my mind at the time. So let me go over here real quick. Um, so what the hell is going on? Basically, this is well over a decade of the company and its leadership completely ignoring the gaming community in favor of having their heads stuck up their own asses. Even the people working under them, the employees, are seeing this and are just as frustrated as we are. A few things, for example, the person claiming that the Japanese aren't offended or concerned. Yeah, that person is a former Sweet Baby Inc. employee by the name of Kazuma Hashimoto. Hashimoto. Take note, because truth is, much of the makeup that is Sweet Baby Inc. are former Ubisoft employees. Take note of the CEO of Sweet Baby Inc., Kim Belair, and her infamous quote from GDC 2019 talking about terrifying marketing teams. And I'll show you that right now. Hopefully you guys can hear this too. I got I gotta I gotta pull this up. Hold on. Hold on. Time out. Technical difficulties. Time out. Hey, this pulled up. I hate the way OBS tends to capture this stuff sometimes. It's really annoying. But we do it live. Here we go. <clears throat> This is Sweet Baby Inc. CEO Kim Belair in regards to consultancy firms to, ta to tackle sensitive topics and topics in research. Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher ups. And if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they don't give you what you want. That particular quote has been making the rounds well since March of this year. Because people have caught on to what Sweet Baby Inc. is, what they stand for, and let's just say things haven't been pretty ever since. Now, I could go into a whole tirade about Sweet Baby Inc. and how this whole thing kicked off to begin with, but unfortunately, <laughs> I don't have a lot of time for that here. I would like to do a dedicated episode where I can kind of talk about that stuff happening right now, but... I unfortunately, I don't know when I'm ever going to have the time at this point, but that's the main topic at hand. What's permeating all throughout Ubisoft can honestly be extrapolated to the broader AAA gaming space. This idea of playing it safe out of fear of offending some group of people or, san or sanitizing your game so much that they become a shell of what they once were an empty product that the consumer isn't allowed to ask questions about, just consume. Why do we add a black, why do we add a black character to a game taking place in Japan? Don't worry about it, you bigot, you racist. Just play the damn game. Or if you like if you don't like it, don't buy it. As one Sean Layden said about Ghost of Yote when people were questioning what happened to Jin. Which the whole don't like it, don't play it thing as of late, has proven to be a death knell for a lot of games as of late over the past few years. That's the kind of thing you don't want to say, because it turns out the people who don't like it and don't play it are a significant amount of people. But this constant preaching about how video games are meant for everyone and made by everyone, but anyone with a lick of sense about markets and understanding tar target demogra demographics will tell you that trying to make something for everyone ultimately results in something made for no one. 
But what's even more damning about all of this? I'm going to show you guys here in just a second. What's even more damning about all of this is this particular clip right here. Go have a coffee with your marketing team Uh. and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they... (laughs) Stop that real quick because it's it's not playing the right sounds. So what happens when OBS doesn't work as intended? Hold on. Jesus. Okay. Now I got to fix that too. Hold on. I like how I decided to play that one again live when it shouldn't have, but go figure. All right. We're good now. Let's go back to that, shall we? For their developers, what happens in practice is that they essentially push out senior engineers promoting junior engineers to senior roles after just a few years of experience, oftentimes with experience in just one engine. Meanwhile, experienced developers with far broader skill sets are being overlooked. This constant cycle of turnover with inexperienced leaders leads to noticeable drops in quality with bugs appearing in their games. The passionate, dedicated developers leave while those who are just going through the motions stay behind. This doesn't just affect the technical quality of their games, but also impacts the design and creativity. For instance, you'll find designers working on FPS mechanics who have never played an FPS game before, or engineers who don't understand how the mechanics they're building are supposed to feel. There's a lack of passion and skill across the board, and the results are obvious. That in itself is incredibly damning, but it's not the first time that I have heard something similar to that, where you have people that are working on these games, or mechanics in these games, like a first-person shooter, for example, who has never even played or even worked on a first-person shooter before. Yet somehow they're working on one. And you can't figure out why the quality of these games is suffering in the process when you keep pushing out senior talent in favor of people that have no idea what they're doing. Nor have the experience to even understand that. But I'll give you another example of this. A few months ago, there was some. Uh, there was a tweet by well, not three months ago. There was a. This tweet came out years ago. People pulled up a tweet from a developer working on Halo. Okay, and I, I, I got to pull this up because this is this kind of lens created so exactly what's been going on. The reason why I say this whole idea of having people work on things that shouldn't be working on them can be extrapolated to the entire industry as a whole. Let me get that for you guys. Hold on. Here we go. This this is it right here. Let me make that bigger on screen for people that need to see it. Hold on. There we go. Now, this guy, Nick, is a developer that works at 343 on Halo. And he says, I honestly don't think I could work on a game that glorifies or fantasizes modern guns, Call of Duty Battlefield Rainbow Six, I've had moments I've struggled with Halo. But the weapons in world are completely sci-fi, which creates a large enough separation for reality. In other words, this person hates guns. But they're working on a game where you shoot guns. Where the entire gameplay foundation is based off of the idea of you shooting shit. And you can't figure out where the lack of passion for these projects is coming from. And again, for the people that I'm showing here, like, don't, I, it's, it's even ridiculous that I even have to say this, but do not go after or harass these people. It's not worth your time. It's not worth the energy and nothing good comes of it. I'm only showing you this stuff to illustrate a point. <laughs> so. Back to the main point at hand. While this topic is about Ubisoft, and it's clear getting, uh, clear getting the wrong people for these jobs runs rampant throughout the industry, hold on a second, I gotta, I gotta move this over here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm hurting my neck. But in a world where games are becoming more expensive to make and more expensive to buy, it becomes 
very easy to burn a customer after they spent nearly $100 on a product. And in return, what they receive is a half-finished, broken, buggy mess. However, that also contains messaging about how bad they are as a person for simply existing. I said it before and I'll say it again. These wounds, especially for the entire industry, and not just Ubisoft, are self-inflicted. Which is the reason why, when you look at the fall of Ubisoft, especially in terms of their market value, you look at Ubisoft stocks. I was watching a video of somebody who's been monitoring their, uh, their stocks, right? A little over five years ago, Ubisoft stocks was about 90 euros per share. Today, their stocks are 9 euros per share. Over the course of five years, they have lost 90% of their value. 90%. This company is on fire and is in constant free fall. And the investors are not happy about this. In fact, with all this fallout, they had an emergency investors call. Which is unsurprising, obviously, considering there's been a, rumors of a hostile takeover for quite some time. And that the investors are kind of rallying together to do so. But one of the key points in this investor call, and whatever, I'll just, I'll just, show, it. I'll just show it to you guys. Sometimes it's better to just show and not tell. So, I'm going to do exactly that. I really wish the clips function on YouTube wouldn't autoplay when you don't tell it to play. Now, this is from the investor's call. That, that This was an emergency investor's call that happened not but a couple days ago, by the way. And this happened right after the cancellation or the delay of Assassin's Creed Shadows to 2025. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining the call on such a short notice. Our second call... To the person you hear right now is Gilmo, uh, the, I guess, the pre CEO, president of Ubisoft. I was talking right, who's talking to investors in this call right now. ...to fell short of expectations. Turning to Star Wars Outlaw, portion of players have expressed dissatisfaction, notably on stealth mechanics and overhaul polish. I want to reaffirm that we are an entertainment-first company, and our goal is not to push any specific agenda. Ghost. Now, I want to stop there, because I want to talk about that specific point he just made. We are an entertainment company, and that we are not trying to push any specific agenda. This coming from the company that recently launched a female and non-binary only mentorship program. This coming from the company that gave birth to a consultancy firm that have been on record saying they want to eradicate whiteness, quote unquote, from gaming. Do you honestly believe that people believe the bullshit about you not pushing an agenda. When you have an entire section, department at your company based solely around the whole idea of DEI, which people would argue is perhaps the agenda in itself. But you're lying to your investors by saying <laughs> that, you're, that you're not trying to push an agenda? And it's very clear that some of these investors are kind of informed about what's been going on, as you'll see as I continue this clip. This comes, this, what you're hearing next is the, the voice of one of the investors. Agenda. Ghost of Yote, um, so the, the sequel to Ghost of Tsushima, looks an awful lot like Assassin's Creed uh, Shadows. So is there a risk that uh, you start bumping into that one that people will not buy Shadows? On the uh, competition uh, related... Let me just stop it there. Whoever this investor is, they're evidently well informed. Because they're aware of Ghost of Yote, and they're also aware that it is, it, it is in fact direct competition to Assassin's Creed Shadows. But let's continue. To Assassin's Creed Shadows, uh, the, the focus is really to make sure that uh, uh, we deliver a fantastic uh, experience um, uh, uh, in, the, in the setting taking place in this feudal Japan um, that should, re should be really enticing. Welcome everybody. 
As you notice, he gave what could only amount to a non-answer to his question. <laughs> he didn't have an answer to that. It's like, what are you going to do to entice people to buy this game over Ghost of Yote? No answer. Uh, it takes place in feudal Japan. It's, it's Japanese setting. Uh, no answer to that whatsoever. <laughs> All this is to say is we've reached critical mass in regards to Ubisoft. And it is unfortunate to watch this company fall as far as it has. Yeah, Japan equals enticing, apparently, at least in this particular call. <laughs> equals win. Yeah, that, uh, and as Fancy said, like a lot of this stuff is typical corporate bullshit. And it is. It definitely is. But the problem now is that a lot of these investors are becoming aware of this stuff now. Like it used to be a case where investors didn't really know what was going on, or at least the, have a gauge of the temperature of the general gaming community and the market. So... It's kind of the reason why these studios and publishers have kind of gotten away with what they have for so long is because the investors weren't really aware of what was going on. But what we're seeing here is that some of them are starting to become educated on what's going on and they're calling them out for it. So what ends up happening here? Well, they're at risk of a hostile takeover. What could end up happening is that, you know, a firm takes over. They end up selling the company and selling all the IPs that it had to different studios and publishers that might want to take a piece of the pie. Honestly, considering what's been going on over the past decade in regards to Ubisoft, that is the best case scenario. Now, also following this, <clears throat> it was said that Ubisoft was launching an investigation within the company from the board of directors. The irony about this is that the board of directors are all part of the Gilmo family. And boy, oh boy, wouldn't it be ironic if at the end of this investigation, they turn out that Ubisoft has no wrongdoing. Listen, we lost an investigation. And we couldn't find any wrongdoing here. So from a board of directors that are also in league with... <laughs> Unbelievable. Unfucking believable. But you know, they're not trying to push any specific agenda, anything like that. No, not at all. They're listening. They're, 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 they're an entertainment company first. That's all they care about. Meanwhile, you turn into a blubbering, stuttering mess the minute you have to face your investors who are questioning what's been going on and your ability to lead the company. But again, this is not just a isolated Ubisoft issue. I can imagine that you can extrapolate what's happening here to the broad to the broader AAA, uh, AAA gaming space as a whole. Uh, this particular video is from <clears throat> an investor call, an emergency investors call. That happened, uh, let's see, the, the, the date on this is, what, the 25th? So, yeah, just two days ago. This happened just two days ago. Yeah, like, this shit is serious. That's how far, that's how bad things have gotten. This shit is serious. 